for Dispatches from India where we bring you major news developments from the country. In this show, we are going to be talking about the plan to change the very face of India's capital that is New Delhi, the prospects for India's economy in the coming months and the latest debates on patents and the vaccine. Let's first take a look at the Central Vista project in the capital New Delhi. The Central Vista project has been conceived as an attempt to change the very face of the capital through massive construction work. Now, among the structures coming up are a new parliament building, a new residence for the Prime Minister. On the other hand, we have a few iconic buildings in the area which will be pulled down. From the time the project was announced, there has been opposition due to its impact on the history of the space and ecological reasons. Critics said that the main purpose of the project was to ensure that the right-wing Bharatiya Janata Party, which is a ruling party in India, led by Prime Minister Narendra Modi, can leave its mark on the capital. They called it a waste of money when it was needed for other uses. Now, this criticism peaked during the recent second wave of the pandemic when work on this project was categorized as an essential service. Opposition parties and civil society questioned this move and they demanded that this work be stopped and the resources instead be diverted to fighting the pandemic. However, the government refused to heed this demand. Urban issues expert Tikinder Singh talks to social anthropologist Bobby Luthra Sinha on the various dimensions of the project and what it tells us about the government of the day. Uh, what I really think what has happened right now is that uh, there is an extraordinary circumstance which has hit us and our lives. And as you rightly pointed out, it's the pandemic. In this pandemic, uh, well, the first stage realities in the first phase, the realities for India were very different and the needs. In the second phase, what we see is that uh, once again, the realities have really hit us hard on the uh, face. And most of them are indicating not only a scarcity of resources, but they're indicating, you know, a lack of will on the part of our political and elected representatives to take on the leadership and, and divert much needed funds and resources into pandemic management. So the Central Vista therefore stands out because not only is it an architectural, uh, it's not an architectural protest now that one sees against the Central Vista. The protest is all about a humanitarian welfare and we as Delhiites and also a network of independent minded citizens see that the government has a great opportunity to correct all that has gone wrong in the pandemic management by diverting the precious resources from Central Vista into humanitarian welfare. And that perhaps will be a better memory for all of us, not just the government, but for all of us. We now move on to an issue that's on the mind of many Indians, that's the economy. The second wave of the pandemic is slowly beginning to subside, very slowly, of course. However, this does not mean that there will be a magical recovery as far as the economy is concerned. In fact, the next few months might see the incomes of working class Indians suffer further as corporates are likely to pass on their losses to them. Journalist and economics expert Arundhya Chakravarti looks at what's in store for the coming months in the Indian economy. We were so worried about surviving the second wave that we didn't really think about the other part which is required for living, which is our livelihood, our incomes. There are lockdowns in various parts of the country and this is likely to continue for two, three months. The only answer India had was universal vaccination and that's not likely to happen before March, April next year. So we have almost another fiscal, at least one entire calendar year, which is 2021, when the economy is going to face certain setbacks. Now, is this going to be a technical recession? And what do I mean by a technical recession? You know that uh, a technical recession is when you have two quarters of negative growth, which means that the economy contracts. It might not be that. But still, when it comes to your income, my income, it might be a mega recession. We might see a contraction of our income. Why am I saying this? Think about it. When there's a lockdown, we know what happens. Shops are shut. People don't buy things. Restaurants are shut. Uh, various dealerships are shut. Cars don't sell. Right? So what happens? People who are employed by these companies, sooner or later, they have to take pay cuts. Sometimes they lose their jobs. We know that several companies again announced pay cuts, right? After this lockdown that, had, uh, that has hit some of our metros right now. Because of that, even those who don't get pay cuts are not likely to get increments. And what happens when you don't get an increment? When you don't get an increment, but prices rise, your real income falls. 
again, those who are self-employed, if there's a lockdown, what will happen? If there's a fear, not just lockdown, fear, things which are essentially services which depend on people coming and coming to the stores, coming to the restaurant, coming to a dealership, coming to a shop, those are going to be affected. And trade, hotels, restaurants, retail, uh, wholesale, these drive a huge part of our economy, drive a lot of jobs in our economy. All of these people will be affected. It's very clear. What does that mean? When you don't have money in your hands, what do you do? You start reducing your consumption. There's certain things you cannot cut down on that you have to buy. And there are certain things which are discretionary, which you don't really need to buy, you can postpone. So that kind of consumption is going to go down even further, right? What does that mean? Companies won't be able to sell. And if they're not able to sell, their sales will go down. And when their sales go down, the only way they can retain their profit is what? One, they cut the salaries and wages, they cut their wage bill. The other is that they cut down on their other costs. Last year, there was a global slowdown. Remember that, the slowdown in recession was global. What that meant is that raw materials were not being bought by companies, right? If that is the case, uh, crude oil was not being used, petroleum diesel was not being consumed. So all these things became cheaper, whether it is steel, whether it is crude oil, whether it is coal, whether it is cement, anything that goes into making things, right? plastics, everything, the demand fell. And because the demand fell, what happened? The total sales fell, but the cost of raw materials fell as well. Globally, cost of raw materials fell. What that allowed India's corporates to do, mind you, is to have higher than normal profits. Their profits grew because the wages were stagnant, right? but their costs in terms of raw materials fell. So even though their top line or their revenues dropped, they were able to make profits because their costs reduced at a faster rate. This year, the rest of the world is actually back on track. And they're going to make up for the lost consumption of 2020, right? So we know that we saw visuals of people dancing on the streets of Spain because Spain has lifted many restrictions. We know restrictions have been re removed in Israel. We know in parts of the US, you no longer need to wear a mask. We know in UK, uh, restrictions are being lifted. Many parts of Europe are uh, gradually lifting restrictions. So what does that mean? Consumption is coming back there. Employment is coming back there. They are going to consume all these raw materials. And when they start consuming these raw materials, what is going to happen? The prices of those raw materials are going to increase. So here's the problem for Indian manufacturers and any Indian business which depends on any kind of raw material, whether it is electricity or petrol, as small as that. Their costs are going to go up, but they mostly sell to India, right? Those who export will be in a good position, but those who mostly sell to the domestic market, they are going to face lockdowns they're going to face reduced income for people. They're going to face a further contraction of demand in the economy. And what does that mean? They'll have to cut prices. So even if their raw material costs go up, they'll have to reduce prices. And what does that mean? This year, things will go reverse. Their profits will shrink. And finally, we go on to one of the biggest debates in India right now, that of patents on vaccines. There have been a number of debates on who holds the intellectual property right for the Covaxin vaccine, which was manufactured by a private firm, but whose development was conducted with the involvement of a government agency. In recent weeks, it has been revealed that the government and the private company, which is called Bharat Biotech, jointly hold the intellectual property rights for the vaccine. Now, the question has arisen that the government, considering the fact that the government had this access and the fact that India is facing a vast issue in vaccinating its population, why didn't it license other companies, especially in the public sector, to produce this vaccine? Newsflix's Premier Purkayasa and immunologist Dr. Satyajit Rath discussed the broad trend of corporate strategies with respect to intellectual property rights across the world. That it is true that it's not about one patent. And in part, that is because most big pharma, um, big IT once upon a time, even today big pharma, tend to build not one patent for one product, but a whole 
patent hedge of literally hundreds of patents fitting overlappingly between each other, covering the entire process of making the product formulation. So this is, this is still admittedly a patent issue, but it is a point to say that we're not talking about one patent. And it's quite possible that some of these patents in the patent hedge are the specific patents for which a waiver is being discussed, but others are drawn from a far more general patent pool and have been fitted here. And oh, those are not about uh, this particular vaccine, so they shouldn't be part of the waiver, is quite plausibly an argument that may come up sooner rather than later. So that's one point, um, uh, which is tactical. The second point is increasingly over the past centuries, ever since the patenting system has been put in place, where originally the whole point was to describe the invention in a way that anybody could reproduce it. In fact, that was the original intent of the patent itself. That was the original intention of the entire patent process itself, to shift to that from a trade secret based uh, practice. But increasingly, what has happened inevitably is that while lip service is paid to full disclosure in the patent, in reality, there is actually not sufficient information in the patent document itself to allow replication and reproduction. And as a consequence, you need to know all the little tricks of the trade, which effectively are then trade secrets in order to make the published patent work in somebody else's hands. And this then becomes an additional lever of in effectively intellectual property over and above formal published filed accepted patents in order to restrict distribution and maintain control for, in this case, for big pharma. So that's the second component. The third component of this restriction is the argument um, most notably, apparently, at least implicitly made by uh, Mr. Bill Gates recently, that it's also a matter of the manufacturing landscape in a, in a particular place in, in, a, in a country and its level of sophistication. Its level of sophistication, both in terms of the benchmarking and the reliability of its supply chains for all the small products that go into the final product, as well as the skill levels and the new tech absorptive capacity of the professionals, of the human resources who are going to do this. And it's at these three interlocking but distinct levels that this entire argument is functioning about, oh, what are the many limitations and restrictions for the global south to be simply taking these miraculous vaccine technologies and implementing them in large scale manufacture? There are two simultaneous arguments. One is they're stealing our intellectual property, which I think was made recently by the American pharmaceutical industry that if we waive patents on these miraculous drugs or vaccines, then China and Russia might start making good medicines against other diseases too. Now, why that should be something which should be looked upon with a great deal of suspicion is another matter. But the idea is not very different from saying the third world countries like India are stealing our property. So it's really going hand in hand with that. And we actually saw that argument with the AIDS uh, epidemic as well. And this was essentially the reason why American pharma companies sued South African, South African government uh, rather shamelessly to see that cheap generics from India does not reach the AIDS patients in South Africa. So that was the big AIDS battle. And it's interesting when you look at the profit margins, for instance, of Pfizer or Moderna. And this year, Moderna has said they expect to make something like $19 billion. They never made profit before, $19 billion this year. So you are really talking about astronomical level of profits from companies who have always been at a loss. 
of course, that is what venture capital does. But coming back to the crux of the issue, that if we want to scale up production to the level that we need, that which is really 14, at least 14 billion doses this year, which means at least 12 to 13 billion will get into people's bodies. Then we are really talking about scaling up the capacity of the world very significantly. Otherwise, we'll not probably exceed seven, eight billion doses this year. And of course, India and China have a big role to play. And interestingly, interestingly enough, South Korea as well, because these have all looks like capacities for producing vaccines at a scale. Now, if I look at the three major vaccine, uh, shall we say, processes that are being followed, one is the inactivated virus uh, vaccine by, for, that is being used, which is Sinovac, Sinopharm, as well as Bharat Biotech. The second is the adenovirus platform, which is, again, it is uh, AstraZeneca, of course, Serum Institute India is following that. And then you have the Damalia Russian Sput Sputnik vaccine. You have also a can Sino vaccine, which is available. And there are also the other vaccines which have come from the US, for instance, Johnson & Johnson, Janssen's vaccine, which all of them seem to be variants of the adenovirus vector vaccine. And of course, the two which have become the star of the show at the moment, at least in advanced countries, economically advanced countries, which is the Pfizer, uh, Moderna, Pfizer, BioNTech and the Moderna vaccine. Now, can we separate them into the three groups, say, the inactivated virus vaccine, vector virus vaccines, and the mRNA vaccines, and look at what are the scales involved. And can we start with the inactivated virus vaccines and what could the world do? And are there any intellectual property rights issues involved in this? So I seriously doubt that for inactivated virus vaccines, uh, any substantively restrictive uh, patent or intellectual property rights would be available. At most, if you are using, as Bharat Biotech in its co-vaccine is using, if you're using a particularly new adjuvant, the adjuvant may be under patent rights, but adjuvant patent rights typically are given non-exclusively because the whole point in an adjuvant is that it should be used as widely as possible. So I don't think that an adjuvant patent right is ever going to be a restrictive uh, matter. I've all said and done, Bharat Biotech got access to it fairly uh, uh, easily. Um, as far as the technology itself is concerned, an inactivated vaccine, uh, virus vaccine technology, um, on the one hand, it's simple. Let's all keep in mind that every year we make and distribute worldwide influenza vaccines. Every year, a new set of influenza vaccines, all of which are essentially inactivated virus vaccines. Now, admittedly, they're still grown in chicken eggs because influenza viruses do grow in chicken eggs, but whether you grow them in chicken eggs or you grow them in human cell lines in industrial scale bioreactors, essentially all you're doing is growing the original virus. That's just a wild organism. There's nothing to patent in it. That it grows in a cell line is common knowledge. So there's nothing to patent in that. All you're going to do is in at bioreactor scale, at commercial manufacturing scale, you're going to, you, you're going to culture cell line, you're going to infect it with the virus, you're going to harvest the virus, you're going to clean up the virus, you're going to inactivate the virus. Um, the commonest method of inactivation is a chemical inactivation, uh, such as beta propiolactone, which is what, for example, Bharat Biotech uses for its co-vaccine. Inactivate it and formulate it, either formulate it by itself, which I think is how, for example, Sinovac's vaccine is formulated, or add, for good measure, a little adjuvant to it and formulate. These are all very straightforward technologies. Mammalian cell culture at manufacturing scale is a technology that any pharma manufacturer who is manufacturing so-called biologic drugs is familiar with and is competent to execute. 
as far as growing virus is concerned, clearly Bharat Biotech has shown the capacity to do so. A whole range of others have shown the capacity to do so. In fact, India has been making uh, um, virus grown like that for polio vaccine, for this, that, and either. In fact, ICMR many, many decades ago made a, an antiviral vaccine for a, what is now an obscure disease called Kyasanu forest disease, um, which was exactly the same. Uh, grow the virus, inactivate the virus, and immunize with it. So that's a technology, the technological capacity for which is very widely available. Intellectual property restrictive regimes are likely to be very lax, if at all present. And therefore, that's a technology that's very easily implemented across the world. The only catch there is that because you're growing, growing infectious virus in large amounts, industrial amounts, um, and this is an infectious virus that causes disease, because of that, as you scale up, the amount of infectious virus that you're carrying in any one place becomes larger and larger. And therefore your biosafety containment security um, provisions and technologies become more and more demanding, more and more robust and uh, so on and so forth. Um, and the simplest way to think about that is, but if many people were growing it in small scale, many small manufacturers were growing it in small scale, it would be feasible. Absolutely, yes, it would be feasible. There's a point I would like to make about this before we move on to the adenoviruses. And that is, given these circumstances, given the fact that the government of India is, uh, along with the government of South Africa, one of the major um, uh, players in this demand for intellectual property waiver for COVID-19 vaccines, I find it incomprehensible that the government of India licensed an Indian Council of Medical Research generated inactivated virus technology vaccine to one single private sector company. That remains true even now. And um, it might be worthwhile asking the government, why is it, has it done this? You know, that's something which is uh, very interesting because we have at least 20 officially registered vaccine manufacturers in the country, all of whom have the ability to do what exactly you talked about. In fact, that's what routinely they do. This includes seven public sector undertakings, which have actually, most of them seem to have stopped making anything. And out of that, one of that was, of course, the famous Hafkin uh, Institute's derivative, which is the vac vaccine biopharmaceutical uh, company, which is in again, Maharashtra public sector undertaking as of now, which has restarted doing this COVID vaccine, hopefully with ICMR technology. And it is, it still is one of the largest suppliers of the oral polio vaccine in India. In fact, I think it has a 9% global share of vaccines by volume. So we have, apparently we have a large number of companies in India who can do it. China is actually, the, the Sinovac vaccine and the Sinopharm vaccine have been farmed out to a number of pro producers, and they seem to be scaling up exactly the way you suggested, that it has been developed in the public sector, in the universities and in the public sector, and this has been, the technology has been farmed out to a number of vaccine manufacturers, and they are scaling up. And that's why China has been able to scale up production quite rapidly not having the kind of Serum Institute facility. It is just they have adopted the strategy Satyajit was talking about. So this is for our viewers that this is a technology which is, which is being used. Unfortunately, India decided to go only with Bharat Biotech. And this, as he says, is not explicable, not only from Indian point of view, because you could have really ramped up manufacture much faster, but also that others could produce instead of becoming a bottleneck. That's all we have time for today. We'll be back next week with more news from India. Until then, keep watching People's Dispatch. For more videos on people's struggles, please subscribe to our YouTube channel.